Uh, greetings, everyone. Um, I'm Nate Angel, and uh, I welcome you all to uh, a session that I'm really excited for, actually, um, because it has two of my favorite people on Earth in it. Um, and, and we're going to be talking about uh, social annotation in um, science, technology, engineering, and math. Well, we may not touch on all those subjects, but at least science for sure, <laughs> um, and many other topics as well. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. I'd like to kind of kick things off by um, just saying a little bit about these two folks, and then I'm going to ask them uh, a, a very specific question so that you can get to know them a little bit better and why they're here. <laughs> so I actually have come to know both of these people best over Twitter, interestingly enough. Um, uh, there's been some face-to-face -face interaction too, but it's actually Twitter where most of our interaction has taken place. And I would say that's one of the, it's actually uh, knowing people like this that has been one of the reasons why Twitter has been incredibly important to my professional practice, because I get to um, connect with um, really uh, fine, finely tuned minds and and really uh, humorous, humorous folks as well um, this way. And so um, uh, I want to uh, formally introduce um, Clarissa Sorensen Unra, who um, has a kind of wears multiple hats um, as both an educator and a scholar, um, working at a couple different institutions in New Mexico that you can see there on your screen, um, as well as globally, uh, where she uh, uh, works to take over the world um, like a certain <laughs> a certain mouse who has plants. That was a reference to Pinky in the Brain. I see that Clarissa got it, and then um, Karen. Kangelosi, uh, who I uh, have had the pleasure to actually spend some time face to face with uh, as well, um, as, as well as online, um, who uh, as a scholar and educator working Keene State in New Hampshire, as well as globally. And I know that one of the things that I kind of remember most about her, if I'm not mistaken, and think about often is uh, that she has a pretty intense um, relationship with spiders. Um, <laughs> And uh, maybe she can say a little bit more of that when we get into it. But I'd like to kick things off here, if my guests will, will entertain this, um, by uh, asking you to say a little bit more about what it is that you do day to day as a scholar and educator, um, and then follow that up with how you came to know social annotation and start using it in your practice. Um, so a little bit about you, and then a little bit about your relationship to social annotation. And I thought I might start with um, Clarissa, who I know as Rissa, so I may accidentally call her that sometimes. That's awesome. That's totally fine. Um, I You did the big head thing. I'm not sure about that. Oh, okay, well, I can okay. move it back. Um, <laughs> I'm like, I'm a little nervous now, Nate. Okay. Yeah. Um, my, I, What do I do in the day to day? I teach uh, full time at Central New Mexico Community College. I teach chemistry and statistics, and I also am a PhD student in learning sciences, hopefully with my dissertation done uh, by summer of next year, crossed fingers. Um, and I'm also known a fair amount of the time for doing a lot in ungrading, which is what my dissertation is actually on. Um, and so it is uh, lovely to be here with you all. My day-to-day -day is mostly teaching and reading a lot of journal articles and coming up with uh, ways to think about ungrading that are kind of novel and design-based research. And so that's what I spend my time doing. How do I know social annotation? Well, I have no idea how I got to know social annotation, actually. <laughs> I was thinking about this, I was like, Twitter? Kind of, yeah. I'm pretty sure it was Twitter. I'm pretty sure it was Twitter, and I'm pretty sure it was Remy who, with his, uh, you know, annotate your hype, your syllabus kind of moment. Um, that was awesome. But I, I use it pretty regularly in classes. I don't use it profoundly in classes, but I love every time that I use it, or I can take advantage of it. So that's. That's kind of how I, and I would love to do more, but I don't teach the higher level classes always that would require it. Got it. And that's, you know, I think we can, let's, we'll delve into that more in the conversation today. Um, uh, let's, let's, let me pose the same question to Karen then. So what is it that you do day to day as a scholar and educator? Um, and uh, how did you come to know social annotation and start using it in your practice? 
Okay, wow. I mean, it is a big question. And uh, thanks, Nate, for inviting me. Currently, I am a program director for the Regional Leaders of Open Education Network, which is a project of the CCC OER, which is the North American node of OE Global. So that's kind of a lot, uh, a mouthful. And many of you might, if you know me, you know that I'm also a professor of biology at Keene State College, and I'm doing this gig as program director for about a year and a half, and maybe longer. We'll see how we'll see how that goes. So I'm, I'm excited about that. So um, I. I certainly came to know social annotation in my teaching practice through being an open education advocate and like doing work in the open. What does it mean to teach in the open? What does it mean for students to be able to learn and create and discover in the open? And so I've used a lot of a hypothesis with my biology students for them being able to engage in conversations with their peers by annotating articles together and not just their peers in the classroom, but across different classes, and even occasionally bringing experts into the conversation. So it's really kind of a, a wonderful thing and tool to use. And when I started using annotation with my students and getting them to get hypothesis accounts, um, they wanted to use it for themselves. So they started creating, um, well, they, they would create a bibliography for themselves on their projects and then they would say, well, let's get into hypothesis and talk about our articles with each other in our own little groups. And um, if they would invite me into that discussion because they wanted some feedback, I would hop in. And if they didn't need me, I wouldn't. So I, I love the way that my students sort of came organically to the way that they like to use social annotation in their projects and things like that. So. Um, I could talk more specifically about my courses and some of that, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave it there for now. And We'll uh, see what else Nate has in store for us. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, that that's so fantastic. I'm I'm curious, Karen. You know, given your the new role that you've taken on, are you are you able to teach less <laughs> right now? I mean, are you un are you not teaching as much? I should say. Yeah, I'm just de I'm definitely uh, teaching less, as in probably teaching zero at least for a little while. Yeah. So this is definitely a full a full time sort of program director gig, but working, but I would say I'm not actually teaching zero because I'm um, teaching others that we can think of ourselves as students, right? So faculty development work is also teaching. I often talk about how I take an open pedagogical approach to a group of people, whether it's faculty, staff, administrators, or what we consider traditional students. So I like to still think of myself as a teacher and a learner in these contexts. So, and maybe we'll even use hypothesis instead of our some of our program development work as we have. Uh, and, and I've done that in all my faculty learning communities, actually, one that I ran recently, which is a learning community for um, STEM through the CUBES network. Uh, we, we have this um, SCORE program. There's a lot of acronyms out there. <laughs> but um, I ran an open practices in STEM learning community that went for about six weeks. And we started with annotating a number of articles and continued to do that too. So, so yeah, while I'm not teaching traditional aged college students, I still uh, think of myself as a, as a teacher. Yeah, I, I love that. And I, uh, I, I think it's really, um, you know, intrinsic to your open pedagogical practices that you don't draw boundaries like that around what is teaching and who is a student, who is a learner, we should say, I guess. And um, so it's great that you're able to take on this new role and yet still probably be everything that, uh, that you had been. Will you still be bringing spiders into your work? <laughs> <laughs> so spiders, yeah. So I am I traditionally my my dissertation research was arachnology, behavioral ecology of social spiders. I worked in the Amazon jungle, and so unfortunately, I don't get to do spider research much anymore. But I'm still a member of the American Arachnological Society. I still have colleagues there, and um, one of the things I'm trying to actually do with the AAS is to help build uh, OER resources for that community. So. Um, and just as a hobby, my partner and I love to actually capture flies and throw them into the funnel spider webs that live in the bushes out front. So we just do that for fun. <laughs> <laughs> feeding, feeding the spiders. I love that. And it's mostly her that wants to do it. I'm like, really, honey? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
We have, I, I live in Portland, Oregon, where I'm calling in from now, and we have quite a few spiders on um, both inside and outside here. So there's quite a, there's quite a lot of activity around, um, around <laughs> the social, the social network of spiders in our house. Um, <laughs> there you go. And we, we try to treat them with respect. Well, um, that is, that is such exciting news for you. And, um, I love that the dissertations that we have here in front of us here include both arachnology, if I'm pronouncing that right. Wow, I'm my my yeah. <laughs> my my Greek is a little little fuzzy, and um, and uh, ungrading, which I think is a really fascinating practice that I believe, in my experience, really dovetails well with, um, I mean, most of the people I know who are using social annotation and working with social annotation often have an interest in uh, ungrading as well. And so, Clarissa, I wonder if you could maybe help us connect those two kind of worlds of, of ungrading and social annotation, or maybe how you think of them as being connected. Okay, you're starting with the simple and easy questions. Yes, I know. I, I um, can you just lay out your dissertation for us? Yeah, okay, let me uh, just make this happen for you. Um, so, I think that what happens is what we're starting to see with with ungrading is that folks who are more willing to ungrade and take on that as a as a set of you know I mean ungrading is really a spectrum of uh, in my mind liberatory oriented pedagogical approaches to evaluation to student evaluation so that that is like its own kind of thing um, doesn't really include necessarily annotation but in in my experience, folks who do formative assessment, who do reflective writing, who do things like social annotation and want folks to think through or kind of critical pedagogue type people um, tend to also embrace ungrading. And so this makes sense on several levels um, in terms of thinking about if you think about uh, not just ungrading as a pedagogical practice that falls under like critical pedagogy, but also because it's a seeding of power in terms of intersectionality, you could maybe start thinking about it as also a pedagogy of care. And that's really, I think, the undergirding um, idea of all of these people who we have as kind of a community of learners, practitioners, whatever, um, that ungrading folks tend to also be very interested in, in implementing pedagogies of care. And that an annotation piece of trying to teach people how to read articles better um, and more clearly uh, in terms of getting the information that you actually need out of them. It's not that they can't read effectively to begin with, but that you're trying to help them see, like this is kind of a skill Sometimes you need to read this part, but that's only if you need to do this um, and start to, to have conversations about what's important and what's not. That all falls under the pedagogies of care. Interesting that you brought up that that extra term pedagogy of care, which uh, folks folks in the audience, I don't I, it, please, you know, feel free to use the chat if you're unfamiliar with the ungrading and pedagogy of care kind of um, discourses, for lack of a better term, uh, feel free to shout out there. And there's there's all sorts of people here who probably will be chiming in and we'll talk about it more on, on stage. Yeah, I I I feel like there's a whole um, sort of um, critical mass. Uh, I see it happening on Twitter, at least. You know, Twitter is going to keep coming back into this conversation. We can't help it. But a kind of critical mass coalescing around um, pedagogies of care that seems to include a lot of these usual suspects, if you will, of, of different practices. So ungrading, maybe social annotation, OER and open pedagogical kind of practices. Um, we might also add to that list um, things like uh, um, uh, renewable assignments as opposed to disposable assignments. Um, uh, and uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, people who are focused on learner agency as opposed to teacher agency <laughs> right. uh, and things like this. And I know you reminded me, um, Rissa, that um, this actually isn't your guys's, you and you and Karen's first gig um, working together to talk about this kind of stuff um, because you led, uh, you kind of co-led uh, an experience 
um, at in another venue, if I'm not mistaken. And I'm wondering if you guys want to, do you want to refer back to that conversation a little bit? Because it could well be that there's a, there's a rich set of resources that people could also explore there. I'm going to have to find it. No, what I, what happened is that I was doing the, the, a digital pedagogy lab track on STEM. And it was the first time I was ever doing it. And, you know, I'm a PhD student. So I was like, let's have 20 articles for you to read. And people were like, no, you can't do that. So then I was like, okay, let me go ask the experts I know who really understand these ideas to have like a conversation on Zoom about what this is actually encompassing. And Karen was so gracious and actually saying, yes, I will come and talk to you about, what do we even talk about? We talk about I OER and STEM? Like what was the topic? I can't, I can't remember. Marissa did we all did the open science. Yeah. I know it was open science, but I think we did critical pedagogy and STEM. Wow. That's what we okay. did together. So, okay. so I had done critical pedagogy one day and then we integrated it into STEM. That's <laughs> I think that's what it's about. I'll put the video in the chat. It'll yeah. Yeah. And I think that like for me, like uh, I, I like to remind people that open education is part of a whole open ecosystem. And as a scientist, like thinking about what is open science and what is open education and how are they integrated? And, and I talk a lot about how those of us that are science teachers, as we're teaching students like how to do science, why aren't we teaching them how to do science openly? So not just like the open pedagogy of science, but the pedagogy of open science, if that makes sense. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of things about how science is done and how there can be ways in which it's difficult for people to think about putting all of their data and results and everything out there completely openly. But I think the open science community has definitely made use of annotation in terms of thinking about not just open access publishing, but open review. And how can you use open annotation for um, giving feedback to each other on every step of the scientific process, not just in the formulation of your manuscripts, but in the development of your methodology for, for your science. And so modeling that with my students in my upper level science courses, I feel like is a good way of saying, hey, you can put your projects out here openly. And, and people are like, yeah, well, they're just students who cares about their projects anyway. But in fact, they're kind of getting in the practice of thinking about what does it mean to share data? You know, what does it mean to use open data sets, which is part of this open ecosystem? And, and how can annotation actually help us think about how we have discussions about um, all of these things. So I love the integration within the open ecosystem and tools that allow us to do that integrative work. and. And annotation is is one of them for sure. Yeah, that's it's. I'm so uh, glad that you went in that direction, Karen, because I think we've now. I think I hope that folks here have a little bit of context around the, some of the things that you guys have done, some of your practices, the way you approach things, um, with this general um, this general talk. But if we if we turn back into social annotation a little more specifically now, um, Jeremy uh, Dean, my colleague at Hypothesis, who I'm sure you know. Uh, from Twitter as well, if not in real life, um, has posed this question. I'm going to throw it up on stage and see if we can we can even delve a little bit more deeply along that thread that you were that you were beginning, Karen. So, yeah, it's a straw question. It's a little bit of a softball, but um, I think Karen, you were already exploring a little bit about why working in the open um, at any level of of kind of uh, moment in your science in your science scholarship, right? Whether you're just a beginning student or, you know, an advanced scholar, working in the open has a, a kind of purpose and meaning. And so if we even just think about reading, like how is it that reading is an important practice in the sciences? And then maybe extend that to, to where social annotation can maybe help with reading in the sciences. I love this question. I think it's such a great question. Um, and like we think of reading as a very personal kind of act. Um, but in fact, what is social reading? Because reading um, is something that we don't always think about, something that we teach in, in college, right? Like that's something that you teach younger children to do. But in fact, how do you, uh, you know, what does it mean to read and actually interpret what you're reading? And, and like reflecting what your thoughts are on what you just read is how we sort of think about what good and extensive reading is. And so having that opportunity to read closely means that you're talking about what you read. And if you can do that publicly in like annotation space, 
then it becomes a social thing because uh, then others are engaging in that reading. We're reading together, we're critiquing together, we're coming to an understanding together, which I think is pretty um, exciting. I love when I see my students annotating pieces and they'll say, well, I think what you mean is, and somebody else coming in and say, well, actually the way I took it was, you know, so if you if you read something and it's only in your head, you're not getting that that benefit there. So that that sort of social socially engaged reading, um, which is done openly, I think is uh, has, has really a lot of value. And I'll let, I'll let Rissa talk for a while too. So take it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Um, well, all right then. Um, I think that the I think you're exactly right, Karen. I think that kind of reading, but I also find students who um, like. I mean, reading a science article is like reading a second language. It's <laughs> not always, not always in words that are easily understandable, um, it, because it has a language into itself. And so sometimes there's some definitions that need to happen. There's sometimes some things that need to be clarified. And certainly, you know, I mean, one of the things that that almost everyone skips in science articles, forgive me if you don't do this, but um, is the methodology section. Because unless you're trying to reproduce that experiment, it is very thick and it's very like, here's all the things that we did and this is all the analysis we did. And so, um, and that's really more results. But, you know, you, you get a sense of like, I can get bogged down for hours just trying to understand this methodology stuff. And so I think that trying to help them kind of understand these are the things that you want to be getting from the articles, not just can you guys talk about them in a general sense and reflect on them and kind of get a sense of it. it, it there's also a piece of scaffolding of, yeah, like Heather was saying, you want to you want to ask some questions and and get some responses because just because you know how to read doesn't mean you know how to read science articles well or easily or that it won't take you for freaking ever to make make it happen and so i think them helping each other is really important there but in terms of like i mean i think this goes for your pro professional development stuff i think it also goes for like phd work one of the things that they tell you constantly to do in phd work is like you should be annotating and you should be right writing micro notes about what you're doing so that you can come back later and figure that out and that's something that could be really helpful i think along those lines like as you're taking notes for yourself and that you know that's what we traditionally call keeping a lab notebook you know when you're an investigator but but why not make that public and social you know and, and i like having students even intro students even my first year students in intro biology like instead of like keeping your closed lab notebook that nobody else is supposed to look at or copy right like this is the philosophy behind open it's like it's not plagiarism, it's not copying, it's a sharing of ideas. So everybody keep their lab notebook open and online right. and out there for others to see. And, right. and the, an easy way to make comments on somebody else's lab notebook, which is basically just a web-based thing, is to, is, to, is to do some annotation. So just kind of, I think right. that the tool is really what we're talking about is that it makes it easier to have that kind of conversation and pro provide feedback in these sort of open lab notebook spaces. Well, and I can visualize it being used in like, I mean, it would be awesome if I had my dissertation in iterations, right? Like I had thought about doing this and then I was like, I don't know, do I do this? I mean, sometimes you just have to do it, but it's also the, the, you know, is my school tied to plagiarism still and whether they're using some kind of, you know, um, <laughs> turn it in or whatever. I, don't get me started on that. But um, that kind of piece of, if I publish, publish it on the web, is it suddenly a published moment? But it would be very cool if we could get past that whole um, idea of plagiarism and particularly self-plagiarism that if I had the iterations and we could just, you know, talk about it as it's a developmental process, I think that's the piece that I really want to see, like wh what you were saying with reviewing and all of these pieces, it would have been really helpful to see the other reviewers' comments <laughs> when I was learning how to review. Because yeah. I was talking about editing stuff and they were talking about the science. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> oh, that's what I'm supposed to be talking about. And they don't share that stuff, right? So that would have been really helpful to know in the process. And to well, and then, yeah, and that's like, I think this whole culture of sort of secrecy, right? And keeping things to yourself. And if you copy somebody else, you're plagiarizing is, is replicated at higher levels where, you know, I'm not gonna put my ideas out there because somebody else is gonna scoop them. You know, what is it that we do and value in the sciences? Is it about creating the individual rock star scientist that goes off and oh, keeps his right. data to himself? I'm using male pronouns quite intentionally there. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, like, so keep that to themselves and so that way they just get a lot of recognition or is it about adding knowledge to the world? And, and I've been right. bringing this up lately too. Like what if there weren't patents on COVID vaccines, you know, right. the development of the vaccine was really, really quick. But in fact, if people shared data and they right. shared their formulas for, we'd have a lot more vaccine, a lot more quickly. Like what does it mean right. to think about public health and, and public advancement right. of science? And so all of that goes back into how do we train our students as scientists to think about right. what it means to do science as part of a community. And if we, right. if we, if we say you're not copying and plagiarizing, you know, your, your data right. set isn't being stolen or scooped. We're actually right. sharing it and we're looking at it together and we're trying to find its meaning together so that we can actually look at what are those results telling us and what are the questions that we want to investigate next and what are the right. kinds of things that we can learn so that we benefit the greatest number of people instead of just trying to do individual or corporate profit. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lapse into a speech now. So I, know, I haven't already. So I'll so stop. Preach into the choir. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> it's all good. Hey, it's that's all good. Did, um, if, unless Rissa wanted to um, follow up with that, um, I know that um, Karen might actually have to leave a little bit early. And there is um, a special thing I wanted to get to, too that I think actually dovetails really well into the conversation so far and might also take us a little bit more into kind of the pedagogy of using social annotation in these contexts, um, whether that be with, you know, uh, you know, early students or, or doctoral students or people who are already working scientists, right? I mean, learners across the board, right? Mm -hmm. So if you'll bear with me, I'm actually gonna share my screen and bring something up here. If you guys, are you guys ready for that? Yeah. I know it's gonna be exciting. So ready. <laughs> this is going to be great. We have the technology. I know now that I've built it up. Uh, yeah, right. so, so where is like, it? How exciting is it? <laughs> He's like, I believe in my ability to ma manipulate the technology. It's fine. Although we, we just jinxed it, right? Um, so <laughs> going nice. back to Twitter. Um, <laughs> go, Heather. I, go for a second here. And I'm just going to point out that... Um, Heather uh, Michelli, Micelli? I'm afraid I don't know how to pronounce that either. I'm really bad with the Italian last names, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> Micelli. <laughs> okay. Another rock star, by the way. She could be in this session. Well, yeah, no joke. Talk about last minute invitations. You should see when I invited her. Um, all right, <laughs> that's it. Heather, if you want to raise your hand, we can bring you up on stage. Oh, Lord. Two, the... two hours ago. That's hilarious. Do you want to? Uh, oh. We got it here. We're gonna Two we're gonna bring ago. Heather up on stage. Um, there we go. Hello. Hi, Heather. Hi. Oh. Yeah, it was two hours ago. <laughs> so you had well, even less than <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I I had 24. Why? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was actually in the middle of getting a manicure. Um, and I got the fabulous. Mask, so <laughs> I was like, sure. Oh, nice. And I'll pretend like that was really poor planning on my part, but it was actually, it came out of this serendipitous moment because this morning when I was um, perusing Twitter, as is my want, there's the English English prof in me, um, I came across this tweet of Heather's where she was- I saw no, this tweet sorry, I over too. something. I, yeah, I, I cut it? myself from writing into it. I'm like, mm -hmm, just leave it alone, Karen. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I did not follow that wise word, and instead, um, I ended up responding. But it led me to it led me to a new understanding of something that uh, that I thought you guys might want to riff on a little bit, as as kind of deeper pedagogues than I am. So you know, Heather was commenting on something that Dan, who I don't know, actually was. I don't actually know Heather until today either, really. really. <laughs> but I mean, sort of, but on Twitter, right? So hey, Twitter. Um, we're new friends, right? Um, but at any rate, we were talking about this idea about 
uh, confidence uh, in class and, and whether that should be a learning outcome of, of class. And then Katie got involved um, too, pushing back on the idea a little bit around whether building confidence, you know, is, is necessarily an outcome. And then Chris joined in um, and started talking about this zone of proximal development, which I believe comes from the, is it Zagotsky? Is that Zagotsky. Zagotsky. Yeah. Zagotsky. Right. And which Russian I, I, learning scientist. Right. A, a Russian learning scientist who I actually didn't know. I mean, I, I knew I knew about uh, his work, but I didn't know about the zone of proximal development work specifically within it. Um, so this was a new learning moment for me. And it kind of goes back to what I think that we were starting to explore in the terms of how is it that we scaffold, for lack of a better term, you know, um, people's introduction into new knowledge, right? If that new knowledge, we're talking about science here, you know, and it's not just about them doing certain exercises, but it's also about having them envision themselves as scientists, the way that Karen was kind of talking about it, right? And, um, you know, uh, learning, learning from Chris and the other people on this thread, um, he introduced me to this um, Wikipedia page, uh, which I'll put in the chat for everybody else's benefit here. Oh, when it comes through as a Twitter link, hopefully that'll work. Uh, about about this uh, zone of proximal care stuff, and I of course took a good look at it using my goo my goofy goggles. And um, I one of the things that I thought was really interesting about it that was a new takeaway for me was how, um, you know, uh, and you guys can speak to this better than I can, so I'll shut up in just a second. But um, let me just get that my my aha moment out, and that was that um, in the process, oh, I need to stop goofy. Um, in the process of helping uh, other people uh, sort of advance the boundaries of their knowledge with certain in certain areas, whether it's science or something else, um, it's not only uh, sort of meeting them where they're at and helping them negotiate the boundaries of what they know already and don't know yet. And so there's like a, a really fine line there to help them sort of navigate that boundary, which is that what this zone of proximal development seems to be about. But it's also that the social part of negotiating that zone um, is what Zagotsky was saying was so important. It's one of the components he was saying is so important. And that's where I started to connect it back to the idea of social annotation and how if we're reading together, we can be exploring that zone of proximal development together in a way that wouldn't be possible if we didn't have that, that social capability. So now I'm gonna be quiet and see if you all have something more intelligent to say about that than, than what I was talking about. So the really interesting part about that is the um, zone of proximal development also talks about how people can be too far along the zone of proximal development. So a professor is like too far away from the students. And so that's where the social part, especially in the classroom, becomes really important because students are much closer to each other's zones. And so there's not a mismatch of expectations versus where the students actually are when the students are learning together. And so that's why social annotation, especially having students read and respond to each other, is sometimes a little bit more powerful than even just responding to the professor um, in right. some way. Yeah, I was going to say good old Lev with his zones of proximal development. Um, <laughs> the, the idea, right, the idea of that is that I can't possibly explain it to you after 20 years of having it, you know, explaining it over and over and over again mm -hmm. as an expert. And this also has to do with power, right? Yeah. It's not just a, a, a conversation about can I do it? It's also uh, do I have, can I, you know, is there, are you going to allow me because I'm the more powerful member of this um, to have uh, a, 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 the same kind of place a, a peer would, which is not easy to negotiate and actually just doesn't happen. And so that's why sometimes when you add yourself into a social annotation group, like Karen was talking about at the beginning, suddenly everyone scatters. Like it's like, everyone goes to the four winds because they don't want to look stupid in front of the professor. Right. And that is really deeply problematic. Um, but in terms of the zones of proximal development, I think social annotation has a wonderful 
place for being able to make that happen, especially if you just let it be. Um, yeah. And I kept on talking about scaffolding because I was like, well, but well, there is a piece of letting it be for a while, <laughs> right? And let it develop and develop and develop and then call into question of like, so what do you think about this? Like, what, explain this more to me or that kind of piece because it's all about timing and framing. Mm -hmm. And so with that, I will seed my... <laughs> <laughs> the good lady from the end. Well, um, yeah, I, I feel like we're talking about a lot of different things here, which is awesome. And, um, and I know that when Heather sort of wrote her first tweet, she was talking about student confidence, you know, and that the idea was that, you know, why would anybody want their students to feel less, less confident than they would more confident in whatever it is they're doing, whether they're learning to write or learning biology or chemistry. And so um, the pushback was, well, maybe it's okay for students to not feel so confident. They don't know everything. That's kind of how I read it. And it is true. Like, it, it, it is true that, that certainly the students are maybe learning about even the whole world of what they don't even know yet, which I think we're all doing. Like, oh my God, I had no idea biology was such a big field. Like, oh my gosh. Like, but, I, but I don't think that they're, I, I don't think that, that students can come to that understanding that there's so much more to know here. I, I don't think that's antithetical to them having confidence. Like they can say, gosh, there's so much to know that I don't know, but I feel confident that I can learn it one day. You know, and I think the idea of building confidence with students or helping them to build their confidence at the same time as giving them a sense of what the vast field of knowledge is. I don't mm -hmm. think our students necessarily come in, you know, maybe there's a few that, I think there was kind of a little bit of a, a tone of, well, they just think they know everything and we need to take them down a peg. And maybe, maybe they didn't mean that. I mean, I, I think it is true that they, will not realize just how much there is to know. But that is not necessarily um, the need to sort of make them feel less confident. I think that we can still help our students feel confident. And that when they work socially, I think I think Rissa was, was really trying to explain this, like, and maybe Heather too, that when they work in a group, you know, they, they can give each other confidence. And maybe it is like all the students can gang up against the professor and their safety in numbers or something like that. <laughs> but, um, but I do think that we definitely want to work towards allowing our students to feel confident, which is really different than saying, oh, yeah, you're such an expert. You know everything already. I think I think there's a real difference there. So. Yeah, I, I work with Katie like Katie works with me at Roger Williams. And I, I don't think she was saying that we shouldn't keep going, like keep up confidence. Obviously she, was, she wasn't saying that we need to bring them down yeah. a bag. We just need to make them realize that they might come in with extra confidence, but is it really confidence or maybe is it arrogance and like kind of deal with kind of those kinds of things. Um, but, you know, one thing I want to I wanted to share with the zone of proximal development, um, it kind of has to do with social annotation, kind of doesn't. Um, I work with my students, I work with non-major students. So all of my students come in with varying degrees of confidence, lots with like zero confidence in science. And um, so I actually have my students, you know, create the textbooks for the next set of classes. And that's one of the biggest places where the zone of proximal development is actually really important, um, is in the text that we choose. And kind of tying that into social annotation, it, that, you know, bringing in that social reading can then help kind of bring that, you know, you, you've got this much to learn, well, if you bring in somebody, you know, the students that do have the confidence, they can bump it up a little bit and close that zone of proximal development. But there's always a lot of mismatch between professors and students. And sometimes that's that gets in the way of student learning because of the zone of proximal development. Yeah, I was going to weigh in on the confidence thing. I think confidence is absolutely critical to build. Um, but that's also different than belonging, right? Being able yeah. to see yourself as belonging mm -hmm. to the science profession. And that is... Um, Definitely. I think that any time that we start to tread on 
the idea of we need to not, you know, we need, is it arrogance? Do we need them to be, is, is still problematic. I agree with Karen in terms of this becomes a, a moment. Cause even if you're just talking to some set of students who have read Wikipedia and think they know everything, um, you're still modeling that behavior for the entire class. And it is, um, I think that, I think that we have to delve into the, the belonging moments there too, in terms of like, have I just killed um, the ability for my native student to be able to see themselves as a scientist because I knocked down someone who was trying to bring up something. It just, it, it strikes me as the wrong kind of uh, moment, but that's also something you have to a little bit look at when they're social annotating. Because attitude does come out. I think <laughs> you're really you're really hitting um, things there, Rissa, like that we're that we're you know talking a lot about. Like um, again, I'm, I'm going back to the idea that open pedagogy is about students students constructing knowledge, not just consuming it, right? And so, and a lot of times people say, well, you know, especially in STEM, our students aren't capable of doing that, and. And so that means right. like, well, our students are not capable of replicating your white supremacist structural way of looking at science, right? So, but maybe your indigenous student has I a way of looking that. at something that you've never looked at it before. And by having the ability right. for them to create their own thing and bring their own epistemic stance right. to this, per, the perspective of what right. you're talking about is such an opportunity for us to, to learn as well. And so I, I think that there's right. a lot of, uh, lot of pieces that you were delving into there. So. I loved that. I just want to record that. Can I have that as your ringtone? <laughs> <laughs> well, and Don't we are, we my are recording this. Dance. Yeah. I, that that phrase comes from um, probably Cher, uh, Cheryl Hodgkin Williams and uh, Patricia Arento. And uh, oh, look, okay, I'm going to find the reference. You guys talk amongst yourselves. I'm going to find it. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay. <laughs> We're creating some say, new knowledge right here. <laughs> you were going to go for it, Heather. Go for it. It really is about like also having confidence in your students, right? Um, that they are capable of of creating knowledge, of of sharing right. knowledge, of making um, of making meaning of things that isn't necessarily the way that I would or any of you would or anybody else would, and so. Obviously, I have a way that I perceive science based on my identities, and that's going to be different from the students that come into my classroom. And right. not giving them the space to do that, whether through social annotation or through um, open pedagogy, and then not punishing them through traditional grading practices when they do right. step out of the box. And that's where this whole thing ties into ungrading, is right. ungrading gives them the risks or gives them the opportunity to take those intellectual risks that if they right. want to think of a different way of looking at the science as in which we know it, maybe bring in an indigenous way of knowing or their personal experiences, the ungrading gives us that freedom to let them do that. Yeah. And to, to embrace that. Mm -hmm. So the, the, and I also think that ungrading and this, this idea of the zones of proximal development were really kind of go hand in hand and that um, we have this idea of what I was referring to as confident failing, right? This idea that you can't, you can't fail in the sciences. And we have a whole body of research that shows all of the successes and none of the failures when science is by definition in some way, shape or form, a failure of an iterative failure until it succeeds, right? So this whole idea of what science means and what it, what it looks like as a practitioner um, is, is something that is we don't convey very well. And because we don't convey that very well, the ontological and, you know, all of these different words 
I hate those big words, but I use them anyway. Um, but this idea of knowing, let's just go with the knowing, uh, different ways of knowing, even if they're an oral tradition or something along those lines, really gives a sense of I can be part of this because I have the ability to share who I am in the midst of this space. And that's part of what I think social annotation allows, as long as it doesn't go, I mean, when I was saying the attitudes come out, as long as it doesn't go to bullying, which I have seen. And that is a very interesting uh, something that you have to deal with as a professor if you do social annotation. Bullying in, in the annotation world, you mean? Bullying in the annotation. I'm like, this is public, by the way. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. But I do want to, yeah, we're going to have to go back, by the way, to the leveraging your networks of experts for the benefit of your students that i think is something that we haven't talked about a lot that we we i know you're, you're driving this nate but we need to go okay well i just i'll just point out that i leveraged my network of experts in order to put this panel together <laughs> so there you have it take it away the last possible second just like yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, more more links coming through. Karen found her. Reference. I did it, and it's um, the uh, adoption and impact of OER in the global south, and it was um, yeah by Cheryl Hodgkin Williams and Patricia Arento, and they they do talk about you know this is in the context of open education, but I think you know I think of social annotating as open education as one tool of open pedagogy and so they when they talk about oer use as access and then participating and maybe maybe remixing as as oer adaptation but the empowerment and the ability to create and look at something new um they use the phrase of being able to assert a new epistemic stance and so i'm, I'm giving the credit to, to where it's due in the <laughs> in the authorship so if you if you Find table one somewhere in that book. You'll you'll see it. <laughs> Actually, when you when you bring up giving credit to Karen, that makes me think too of something I've been struggling with lately, and it ties back to a practice that you brought up at the very beginning, which is where your students create bibliographies mm -hmm. and then together socially annotate works in them, which I thought was a really cool practice, and we should talk about that more. Oh. But it, it makes me think about, and I know this is so true in the humanities and probably in the sciences too. There's such a um, that the education system is so primed to make citation and reference seem like like the most important and risky riskiest thing that you can do and to get right mm -hmm. you know like at least in the humanities all the effort that's spent about formatting citations correctly yeah. it's just like you could walk away from a an educational experience feeling like formatting your citations correctly is the only really important thing in intellectual work yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> so i'm wondering <laughs> I'm wondering how this question of citation and reference yeah. um, plays into this conversation about belonging and also scaffolding kind of reading and, and, and kind of seeing yourself as a scientist. Yeah, and maybe there's a librarian in the crowd because I think, you know, librarians can really speak to the need for, you know, proper format for citation so people could find stuff, right? They always say, like, what's the best way to hide something, you know, or like to, if you want to hide a book put it on the wrong shelf in the library. And, you know, and so now in our cyber world, you know, if you can't find it, it's this is literally, it doesn't exist. And so I don't want to say that, no, yeah, formats don't matter at all. Um, but, but when that's all that we're teaching and we're not teaching the context of why, like you want to be able to find something, you want to categorize it for a reason. You want to say that it belongs here and not there for, for why. I'm, I'm involved in this whole sort of tagging ontology group with my uh, Cubes community where we're talking about what bins do we put things in and why. And so, I'm, again, I'm getting a little bit off topic with that. Um, but I do think that a lot of what I've done with my science writing that my students do is, is to use the hyperlink more than citation format. Like instead, instead of you copying and getting it right, you know, when you're citing something, just hyperlink to that source, even if it hyperlinks to a paywalled abstract, like that you can, you can find that later. And, and we know that hyperlinks can die and, and become outdated. So there's, there's that problem as well. But I think as information is kind of, always evolving it's dynamic it's ephemeral and so hyperlinks maybe don't last forever but you know literally nothing lasts forever <laughs> you know, so as we keep keep them updated and keep your next group of students making sure they work and, and refreshing them that 
that kind of teaching, how do I find something, what's relevant, what's connected to something else is more important than make sure you have a colon and that you have a semicolon and that you format for CVE. And, and it's like, they don't understand why, like that seems out of out of touch for them. I like that you you moved into a different voice <laughs> the, during the semicolon. Nice. That's the citation. Nice. Police that motion. was the punctuation that got you. I started you. with the um, formats uh, are important too. Yeah. yeah, yeah that's that's well, and, I think the information literacy of like, I mean, integrating some of that information literacy of uh, this is why it's important and that, it, that we're trying to give credit for the words to whoever was uh, writing them. Um, not that that's the first person who said them, but, you know, in all of those pieces of trying to really make sure that folks understand the whys behind citations. I was going to say that um, if hyperlinks don't work forever, DOIs don't either. So, you know, just in terms of talking about things, but it is still, um, I think that it's important to recognize the scholarly practice of when, when we um, use kind of, um, cause this is a big thing in annotation too, like what's the difference between a blog and a peer reviewed article? And let's start examining that. Like, why is that important at all? Um, and, and to some degree I'm like, and as at a, teaching at a community college, we don't have access to the journals. So what does the difference between a preprint site mean in terms of the journal that it goes into versus the blog that was used to share information and what are all of these things have in common and what are what do all of these things like actually give us in the end i think those are all important considerations when you're social annotating or the the blog that gives us misinformation well yeah i was actually going to kind of address that because so like my students create these websites with lots of really current information. Like my students just wrote about the winter storm in Texas this past spring. There's no journal articles about that right now. So there's only like maybe a couple of blog posts, news articles, that kind of thing. And so if they're getting information from different news sources and maybe they don't know, maybe if they're local news sources, they might know that, you know, a political slant, perhaps. Lo local news is a little bit less likely than national news, but still being able to link to that so that the reader kind of gets the idea like, oh, that doesn't seem quite, that doesn't seem quite great. Where are they going? And then the next set of students could maybe fix it by checking out the source and kind of going from there. And, um, and I can as well, um, but it, it does lend itself to being able to check that misinformation when it happens. Well, and I think what we're talking about is the triangulation of information, right? Like learning how to triangulate different mm -hmm. data sources is actually incredibly critical to science and to STEM, like to writing articles and to understanding whether this data actually reflects what's happening in whatever research you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of, idea is like, I'm like, why don't we teach information literacy like that? And many people do. Um, but the social annotation also talks, I mean, especially if you're starting to say, can you give me some, like some evidence as to why this works the way you think it works? Again, that's inserting myself into the social annotation, which totally kills the ZPD. But, you know, the, the idea there is that starting to be like, why do we make the points we do? And how can we make sure that those points are evidence-based in a way that reflects what's known and what's unknown? And what does, and I mean, even going as far as to saying what is knowledge anyway? Yeah. And, and kind of, um, I put something in the chat going back to something you said a little bit early, earlier, Rissa, about publication. Like, what is it that's really important like what are important outputs of the work that we do? Because sometimes publication becomes for publications its own sake, right? Like, oh, I've got 12, I've got 24, I've got 32 publications, but what does it need to have a meaningful output to the work that we do? And I, what I put in the chat is a, a link to um, 
DORA, which is, um, what does that stand for? The Declaration of Research Assessments or something. But they're talking about how we use journal impact factors to say how important something is. And like, and, and so if, if we actually looked at pure data sets instead of publications as outputs, you know, then we take away the idea that you have to publish in a really well-known star kind of journal. And, and then again, getting back to that idea of like, what are we, what are we teaching our students? You know, are we teaching them how to produce something that can be valuable for other people? Or are we teaching them to put something in a format and get it to, in a certain track for a certain journal that has a certain reputation so that you can build your own scientific reputation? And, and I think this starts at the, at the beginning level, you know, working with undergraduates, maybe high school students, like what are the, pathways that we take to be training the next generation of scientists. And, 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 and so I think about these things when we get lost in the weeds of whether to cite something or not, how, how to think about publication, we're already making assumptions that the structures that we have that exist right now are just good and fine and we should keep replicating them. So, but I love these people that are taking on everything, like funding agencies and institutions and, and all of this. So. Right, because I was just arguing this point at some point with um, with a couple of funding agent national funding agencies, and trying to say, look, at the community college level, publishing it in a, a paywall journal does it's absolutely no good. Like this is going to get me uh, exposure to exactly no one that I want to have exposure to because those people don't have the paywall access, um, and so in terms of thinking about it, I have to think about it differently. And then you start to say, well, then we can really talk about the annotation moments as an open annotation piece on like the preprint servers. Like, why can't we do review differently? That's right. And I was just saying, and those publishers are making buckets of money, right? Like, it's really like, oh, yes, you've got your reputation, but they're, they're, it costs money to publish there and it costs money to subscribe to those journals. And Hey, I'm, I'm also getting the word that Heather needs to head out. I know she does. And I actually, thank you so much for dropping in, Heather. It was, it was a yeah, great no moment problem. of serendipity. Yeah, thanks so it much. It was lovely to see yeah, you. Yeah, it was great. lovely to see you all thanks as well. Thanks for dropping in. Yeah. Bye. 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 And um, on that note, I know that um, Karen may also need to go a little bit early, which would just leave. That leaves us, us uh, hanging out, huh? Yeah, it leaves us hanging out, can, um, which I can't imagine that we'll have anything to talk about. You can talk, talk about. about us while we're gone. And... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll watch the video well, later. Is that what we're talking yeah. about? Yeah. So I, I do want to give you the opportunity, Thank Karen, if you, you do need to go Thank now. Thank you. I am uh, super busy and going to jump off to actually have a meeting with a student. So that's. Lovely. Oh, that, hey, that's a worthy cause. It's been a pleasure. But thank you so much for it's the invitation. It's been a pleasure as always. It was really an honor to have been asked to be part of this today. And uh, nice to see you again, Rissa, and you, Nate, for sure. And hope our paths will cross in real life again soon. Yes, that would be. Uh, I know, yes. right? Yes. That'd be awesome. All right. Take Let's care, everyone. All right. Thank you bye so much, bye. Karen. Do it. Bye. bye. And then there were two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for the Agatha Christie moment. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I think now we're just in full pinky in the brain. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let's let's plot to take over the world. Fantastic. Exactly. I like that. And I mean, um, I want to uh, invite our audience to uh, to get involved as much as they want. Um, if we're not taking this in the right direction, because we're sort of free farming it here, um, feel free to uh, feel free to weigh in. And one thing that I thought might be kind of fun is if we maybe tried to spend a couple of minutes delving even more specifically into social annotation. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and in your work, um, one thing that I wanted to bring folks attention to, um, because it, we sort of been talking about it a little bit is um, the science in the classroom program mm -hmm. that triplees. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to put a link in here to the chat. We could even bring this up on screen, I guess. Um, but only if it um, only if it dovetails with with your the way you do things, Clarissa, because oh, yeah. it's a little bit of a different practice. Yeah, um, no, I've I've totally done science in the classroom. I really I actually started using them for statistics 
when I started teaching statistics, they had data tables. And this is where it comes back to Karen's idea about open science, that there were freely available data tables that my students could run statistics on um, and, and start talking about it. But the context was not as important as the statistics was if they had if I, I don't know if annotation is allowed on here but if annotation is now allowed on here it would have been amazing to have uh, an annotation moment i guess i could have done annotation with this i didn't really think about it at the time um so that looking for statistics here to see what Oh no, yeah, you have to like get like a biochemistry or chemistry, oh, okay. like a biology, and then you just okay. take the the table. Got it. Um, but there might yeah, have even that, been one in that article I had up already. Let's see. Right. So so I think the idea there is that it is extremely powerful to be able to to talk about these things. And the first time I actually did um uh, a social annotation of something in a in a group for my classes um, was on an the and the data what was that it was Anne Marie's um, the use of the effect, the use of data um, oh you know what I'm talking about <laughs> I, I sort of do um, it's it's like the ethical use of data. Oh, that, oh, oh that, yeah, yeah. That's through. That's through. Um, uh, I don't even know how to say it, the uh, Athabasca. Yeah, um, I will look for that. You keep talking. Yeah, yeah. No, that that um, because I I felt like that was the first time that my students. Uh, yeah, the principles for ethical use of personalized student data. There you go. That's what it is. Okay, I think I'll put it in I the can, chat. Okay, and I think I can pop it onto the screen as well go. here. Um, it was, uh, I used it because so many students don't realize how their data is being used. And I just thought this would be a very interesting, from a statistics point of view, where we're trying to gather data and people are trying to sign consent that, yes, you can use my data. Well, what does that actually mean? And how is it being used? And what kinds of considerations do you have to? put into that. And so that was actually the first time that I ever did an online um, annotation. And it was, it was super cool. That was actually really fun. Um, but then I had to stop teaching statistics because they used respondents. But anyway, it, it, this would have been very cool. I didn't do it publicly. Sorry. Right. No, that makes sense. <laughs> I, I, would, I wouldn't have done it public. And often with students, you have to make that consideration of like, am I going to, are we going to do this publicly or are we not? Karen always comes down on the do it publicly. Why not? Um, right. And I often am like, well, you know, there might be some, some growing moments that I don't want you to have to do this publicly. Um, because I, I don't want it held against you if someone somehow found it and you're trying to run for something, right? Like I just, right, right. you need to have growth space sometimes. Um, and you can still invite experts to that growth space, which is why I like the private group idea in Hypothesis as well. Yeah, and anytime this topic comes up, I always um, reach toward um, an English scholar, sorry, uh, Amanda LaCastro, who... Um, was the first person who introduced to me this idea of, um, again, scaffolding people's mm -hmm. social annotation experience so that right. the f when you begin the process, you might be annotating privately, even just with yourself, right? Just making right. private notes, then maybe expand it out a layer to your classmates in a particular group or, right. in, a, or in a particular learning community or something like that, and then maybe go public, fully public later on when you're when right. you feel ready for that. Right. And I, I love the layering that you can do with annotation, which is why I don't understand why even the publishers who require like three or four reviews don't have each individual reviewer do the annotations and then at least overlap them to see what was consensus, right? What was the, what were the things that everyone agreed on? that um, might be helpful. And, and for someone like me at the beginning of my reviewing career, maybe inviting me into that space so that I can understand how my review comments fit into the larger picture. 
Um, and that just doesn't happen. And I, I kind of don't understand why not. Yeah, it's interesting all the connections here between, you know, everything from the kind of practice that one might have, even with, you know, like primary school students, right? right. All the way up to the highest level of scientific practice when it comes to peer reviewing in journals. It's right. it's sort of the right. same set of concerns and issues all the right. way through that whole whole network, right? Right. Um, and and if we're citing, if we're getting ORCID, uh, I mean, kind of citations on whether we review things or not anyway, then why not just tie our name? I mean, I know a lot of people have problems with tying our name to reviews and that that needs to be an optional thing because if you're a relatively new scholar, then if you're reviewing someone who's like high profile, it becomes scary. And the opportunity for failure is kind of scary as well. Um, but I, I do believe in, in tying your name if you want to. Um, and having someone to talk, you know, recognizing that a review is a conversation is more than it is now important. right because now right? It's, it's not now it's like this it's weird not. thing where a reviewer too who's anonymous right like just says something and you have no idea who they are or what the context of them saying it was or... well and sometimes i've been reviewer too and i was like you know that came off way uh more you know i really try to be nice and and some of those, you know, very congratulatory on like, actually you got something out. So <laughs> way to go. But also like, um, here's, here's all the things. And I, you know, you see the wealth of comments that <laughs> you've just put yeah. down and you're like, I think I just became reviewer too. Yeah. It's <laughs> extraordinarily difficult to give positive focused feedback and this is true in ungrading as well. This, it's incredibly difficult to give positive focus feedback that is interpreted correctly by the person who's getting that feedback um, or interpreted in the way that you intended, maybe not correctly is the way that you want. And so sometimes, even if you really have practice with this, you write down a comment, you read it three times, it seems good, you send it off, and then it was entirely misinterpreted by the person on the other end. And you're like, I thought I had that. And so the conversation would have been really helpful to be like, no, 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 I didn't mean that I meant this. And this is why it's important. Right. Um, and like that, that, sorry, that's, go ahead. Oh no, that's, that's just, that's just missing. Yeah. And it's uh, in the crazy. peer review process. You mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's missing in the peer review process and it's, it's missing. Um, when you don't do things like ungrading as well, you just evaluate people for their annotations. Like that, that needs to be a conversation because anything can be misinterpreted. <laughs> it just, it just requires some, you know, talking like, okay, you know, let's, let's talk about what you meant here. Yeah. And one reason I'm leaving this um, science in the classroom up on the screen too, is um, there's kind of talk about annotation all the way down. There's a couple, couple layers of things going on here. So the AAAS that that um, produces this uh, this resource of science in the classroom, which is really designed to help um, early science learners kind of get acquainted with actual scientific publication and the complexity of reading that, right? Right. And, and they have, um, they expose this learning lens um, sort of framework. That's awesome. On the right, and so you can highlight um, different la awesome. layers of yeah. um, what's going on. And then this will actually, you know, just um, uh, kind of bring up the words, uh, uh, definitions of the words. And I was, I had this results and conclusions highlighted here. And here's right. the really cool thing. So behind the scenes, their act, science in the classroom is actually using grad students and early career scientists to make annotations on scholarly articles that are then exposed through these layers. Nice. So it's That's actually awesome. a practice that more advanced science students and practitioners can get involved in as a way to help early science students kind of get their get their understanding That's built amazing. up. Amazing. Well, um, yeah. And even the authors, right? If you could get the authors to comment on what was the point that you meant here? Like what was yeah. this really about? It just that's another moment of leveraging your personal networks for the benefits of your students. Like every time you bring an expert in or have someone talk, you know, they're going to be able to to talk about that um, particular piece of work without uh, someone else's interpretation. And if it's a if it's a particularly 
important thing um, to the, whatever you're, you know, trying to cover, then sometimes you want that perspective. And it also connects your students with people in the, the workforce so that they can, or like, or the STEM <laughs> world or whatever yeah. you want to talk about it, right. right? So that they can actually start to be like, okay, these are actual people. And it's, uh, you know, journal articles, you know, there, there's always the joy of, you know, as soon as you hit send, you find the five typos, right? Like it's always yeah. something um, that, that you may have not have stated. And my point is always the conversation. Like, why aren't we having conversations about this, even with the earliest learners? Right. And I think, and I mean, just to draw the finest point, right? That's what social annotation really can enable in, right? in, in any of those um, arenas of privacy or those levels of privacy, whether it's just with yourself, that conversation with yourself, right? Like the conversation with the reader that you were the first time you read it versus the reader that you are the second time you read it or the third time right. and you come back and find your notes. Because right. you evolve, you you've changed. I won't say evolve. <laughs> <laughs> the biologist hopefully, is gone. But... Hopefully, you know yeah. the the thing is is that you do change. You look at things differently way long way later than than you did to begin with. Um, you know, someone was asking me about the ungrading chapter um, that I wrote, and I was like, yeah, I'm kind of not there anymore. Like that's not what I'm thinking about <laughs> at all. Um, and in fact, I didn't even do the reading to come and talk to you about it, um, which is horrible, <laughs> but you know, there you go. Right. Um, but that, that kind of piece of like being able to reflect back on, on what you were doing. My only problem with that is that we spend so much time doing PDFs in, um, in like, especially higher level work. And not having an ability to to do those PDFs in like a private group or through a Dropbox or something would be super helpful. Um, it, if it, it like not requiring that it's embedded in the LMS. Yeah, well, there is. Um, there's actually like a little secret magic that can that can help there that we could talk Ooh. about. Ooh, and we could do that. Um, I like and, that. And we want to get really practical. But actually, I was, I was, my, the next thing I was going to say is um, even really taking a really tangible direction. Like, so you're a teacher, you're primarily teaching in the community college, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yep. Um, so you've got not only early learners, but, um, you know, learners who are just kind of at the very beginnings or um, sort of continuations of their college, yes. their college work, right? A, a very right. specific kind of student student right that you're encountering well many different kinds i'm sure but yeah they're um, all in the same classes which makes it super fun yeah <laughs> right which is it's always fun um because all learners are exactly the same right yep. um, <laughs> but i'm kind of curious so when it comes to your social annotation oh practice what like what is what are some of the first ways that you that you've introduced it with students to get them used to, maybe i don't know maybe they come in and they're already like oh annotation i know all about that but I'm guessing you know, not. It is taught a lot in elementary school now. So there are there are a fair number of people who do come in with some kind of understanding of what annotation is. And then there's a whole bunch of folks who are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, and, and that doesn't, <laughs> I can have high schoolers because we have a high school on campus mm. that, um, and that does, you know, the high school thing and does, first two years of, of college at the like same AP time. Like AP stuff sort of, yeah. Right, so so not even AP, they're just taking college classes. They're, oh, trying okay. to get, they're trying to get a high school degree and an associate's at the same time Whoa. when they when they graduate. And so nice. when we have, uh, you know, I can have those folks, 16 year olds who absolutely know how to annotate everything. And I can have people who already have two masters and not really understand what the requirements of annotation are for science um, or for STEM, because I've got, had this in statistics as well. And so it's, it's partially about teaching what annotation is, but it's also, um, I tend to approach most things <laughs> experimentally. So I tend to be like, let's just do it and see where we go. Right. So, and you can start seeing other people's comments, right. And start to see, oh, well, mine is really different from theirs. How is that different? And, and why is that important? Um, but my, my point in annotation at the beginning is reflection, right? You, you're trying to learn how to, to 
reflect on what you've read and be thoughtful about what you're saying in the columns, but you're also trying to be reflective about what other people said about this and, um, you know, comment and have a conversation and ask for clarification if that doesn't make any sense. And if, I mean, everything has to be a learning opportunity, but starting with what, sh what your ideas are is almost always easier than trying to be like, well, from this sentence, I, you know, understood these 12 things. Um, so I, and, and as you do this more and more and more, I mean, the genius of the AAAS thing is that they're getting graduate students and early scientists who have been reading endless articles. The more you do it, the better you get at it. <laughs> so it is, um, it's right. one of those things that you just have to start practicing as soon as possible. And that actually, um, Chris has added a question here um, from the audience. I'm going to bring it up on stage. And so, yeah, I was kind of had this way too. So, do you? How do you go about introducing it, like just tangibly, with the students? Do you do you model it for them? Do you how how do you get them? Like, uh, do you have the high school students run out in front and show folks what to do? <laughs> So this is what we learned. Um, so the idea of annotation, the way I approach it, is that it's going to be iterative. You're going to do it multiple times. So the first time you look through the the um, article, you're going to find things that kind of call out. And maybe you haven't, you've read it the first time and you read it really carefully. But I would recommend kind of not spending all your time reading for really in depth. Just kind of go through it and see what jumps out at you and make note of that. Get the lay of the land sort of. Yeah. yeah, get the lay of the land. And then let's look at it again and uh, think more in depth about like, okay, what were the authors trying to convey in the midst of this? What did they think was important? So there are some, there are of course some, some questions that you can ask um, that are, that are based off of the basic premise of a science paper. Um, but you can also say, you know, is the introduction as important or the literature review as important for maybe people who have been reading a lot of these things, right? Like one of the things that's lost on people is that the more you read in a certain field, especially not people, students, is that the more you read on a certain field, the more, the less you pay attention to the <laughs> literature review because you've already read all of that. Um, and so some of these things that come over time, I think that there's a, a lack of understanding that maybe, you know, maybe some of these pieces are more important as you begin and they become less important over time. Maybe some of these people pieces are actually not important at all. And what you're really looking for is this piece. And it's all about reading for the purpose that you're looking at that you're trying to trying to figure out why am I reading this and what am I trying to get out of it? Yeah. And that's um, I, like you were saying, I think that's where that triple A uh, science in the classroom thing really, as you click through the different lenses that they have, it, it really um, accentuates how right. you're just highlighting just one set of the pieces in the article to focus on at a time. Right. Of, right. Well, isolated. you can highlight them all at the same time sure. too. Yeah, right? you could. So you'd be <laughs> yeah, like, then, Whoa. Boom. Yeah. But then also recognize what's been taken away, right? Like if you, if you look, I, it would be really interesting and I haven't done this cause I didn't know about the triple AS thing. Um, but what I would be really interesting for me in beginning science classes is to have them highlight it all and figure out where all the white space is. Like what was all the stuff that wasn't important at all? Let's try it. Right. We'll like do it right this, now. What's the what's the piece of of you know was everything important or were there things that really weren't and I think the more I was reading Aaron's comment over here um, I think you absolutely want to try to normalize as much as possible in terms of um, and I hate I hate norming don't get me wrong I'm a sci I'm a statistician and I don't like um, the practice of norming because it yeah. always brings up grades for me yeah, and that's yeah. like not a good practice at all. Um, but the idea here of 
the people who are writing these things are not perfect. <laughs> And they're never going to be perfect. And sometimes they look back at their own stuff and are horrified by it. Right? Like this kind of idea of like, no, this isn't something that everyone has to have a good sense about. And we all learn as we go is like actually important. Yeah, look at that. Look at all that stuff that's not highlighted. Yeah. And, and of course, I'm not going to quickly say that it doesn't matter. But it's interesting, you know, only right? maybe, only maybe I'll say 25 to 30% of this article is maybe highlighted. Um, right, right. And that's the thing that I think a lot of folks that I see with um, with a lot of students, they're reading every single sentence as if it's the most important thing. When, in fact, a Ooh. lot of this, you know, as you get to the results, it becomes more important, right? Yeah, look at I bet that. You there's more highlighting with the results in this discussion and the conclusions. Ooh. There's a little there bit is in almost, the almost anywhere else. Yep, you're right. That's the densest, the densest part here is in this results section. Right. And and I would love to use that as a moment of just saying, look, <laughs> when we say skip to the results and discussion, we mean skip to the results of discussion because that's the literally. most important part. Yeah, literally. Yeah, and maybe you go back then and even internally in the document, you think, okay. Right this results in section it's maybe referring to things up above and right. that's that's your clue to maybe go back deeper into the article and find out what they're talking about right and that that piece of also skipping to the end skipping to the conclusions and then referring back is something that my students absolutely do not understand they don't understand that you can do that they're like you can do that i'm like yeah yeah, you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's allowed. Yeah, that actually sounds like a great, you can do. a great introductory exercise, right? It's like, we're all going to go to the end of the article. We're going to find one thing in the results and conclusions section. And then we're going to try to figure out where it came from <laughs> right? Back, going backwards in the article. Right? It's like, um, you know, I, I, uh, yeah, I like what you're saying here, Chris, in terms of, uh, you know, you could look at for the what's really cool about this is you could look for the densest highlighting and start to be like, are there conclusions that we can make based off of where this is? <laughs> right. Um, and that that's uh, another whole set of analysis skills that you get out of things like annotation that you're not going to get easily in any other way. Yeah, that kind of goes to something that a lot of educators in all disciplines have been saying in their findings anecdotally, anecdotally, wow, can't talk, um, about this work, you know, and using it with students is that when students pre-read with annotation, what that can really help them do is understand where the students are focusing their attention in the reading, and then that can shape what happens in the class, right? right. Because you come into the class as the, as the teacher, sort of empowered by uh, the record of the student's passage through the text, and you can use that to right. shape what you're going to do in class. Right, right. And that it really, um, all of this goes to the point of helping students feel like scholars, right? How is knowledge created? How is knowledge co-created? Co How is knowledge reflected? Um, you know, helping students feel like scholars early on is really... Uh, an important thing um, in terms of helping them feel belonging and, and what have you. And so that idea of like all of us are fallible, um, even if you've won a Nobel Prize, you're still fallible, which it was a, I wish I had saved the tweet that um, uh, I can't remember her name. Um, like I don't can't remember names at the moment. Um, but all right, you're uh, really you're you're on the spot here. Aren't so. I? Aren't I awesome here? Um, yeah. yeah, it's just it's just amazing. So um, well, we all second. we all we don't have to be perfect. I think you were just saying we all right. Have our Wasn't I just saying that perfection is overrated? I was. I was. I think I was. Um, okay. So let me get down to the end here because it's all. It's all in chronological order. Of course. I was going to say, uh, it's Francis Arnold. There you go. Francis Arnold, within like uh, uh, like three weeks of winning the Nobel Prize, had to retract some papers 
um, because they just weren't up to the level. And I was like, I wish that every Nobel Prize winner had something like this, where like, absolutely, like, I won a Nobel Prize, and I still make mistakes, people. That's just how it goes. And that would be just amazing to see even at the highest levels. I was like, that is such an awesome modeling of the behavior right there that I wish I had saved it. Yeah. Well, finding, finding tweets, it seems like it's gotten harder and harder. Although I did right? notice a new thing in the interface to the mobile Twitter app. Now, I don't know if you use Twitter lists at all. Yeah. But if you do, you can pin them and sort of, Oh, nice. and if you pin a list, it then becomes like a swipe away in the navigation of your mobile device. So you can pop right over to viewing the, uh, the nice. pin list. That's a little, nice. uh, little <laughs> side segue yeah. into Twitter. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think anytime oh, you, and Aaron nobles found... in chemistry. Yeah. <laughs> nobles in chemistry tend to be real honest, apparently. apparently. Um, so, <laughs> so Nobel laureates, I should say. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I think that that is absolutely critical for folks to understand that this is this is a process you get better at it as you do it so i mean that's science in a nutshell right right <laughs> or at least the way it's supposed to be the iterative process yes iterative process. well i see that we have reached the end of our scheduled time we've also <laughs> said so many different things that i can't even keep track of it all <laughs> What in the world have we said? What, what have we said? Fortunately, there's a recording and we'll be able to come back to it. We do have at least one person, Chris, nice. Chris uh, from from Nova, um, who said that it was valuable. So we know at least one person okay. was benefited from our conversation. <laughs> one, today. one person. I'm, I'm yeah. thrilled. I'm thrilled. Thank you, one Chris, person for at a time. that comment. Uh, I appreciate um, that. But I, I would like to say that um, I had a just a fantastic time uh, here lovely. today. <laughs> I hope you did, too. I really, Absolutely. really appreciate you coming um, and our other guests as well, Karen, of course, um, and that Heather was able to pop in was awesome. Uh, yeah. I love that serendipity. Um, and so is there anything that you'd like uh, as a parting shot to leave us with before we go on with our busy days? You don't Think have to. About, uh, you know, I, I would say um, anytime that we can revisit our practice and be reflective about it, it's important. And so using social annotation software might be something you want to use. But I think reflecting on it first and trying to f find meaningful ways for you to use it is is absolutely critical.